Hello, everyone. Welcome to another Asia Global Institute Public Policy Webinar. I'm Hei Wai Tang, the Acting Director of the Asia Global Institute. The AGI Public Policy Webinar Series invites leading scholars from universities, think tanks, and research institutions around the world to present the current research on global public policy issues and discuss their implications for Asia and the world. We are glad to have Dr. Hong Song Xing, Economic Advisor and Head of Research at the Bank for International Settlements, to tell us something about his work on central bank digital currency today. Dr. Xin also co-leads the Monetary and Economic De Department and is a member of the Executive Committee of the BIS. Before taking up his current position in 2014, he was the huge Rogers Professor of Economics at Princeton University. Having previously held appointments at Oxford University and the London School of Economics. He has been an intellectual leader in the fields of banking, international finance, and monetary economics, topics on which he has published widely, both in leading academic and official publications. One area of his recent focus has been in developing the BIS research program on digital innovation and the financial system, including the design of central bank digital currencies and the implications for users, financial intermediaries, and the central bank. Dr. Shin was part of the BIS management team that developed the BIS Innovation Hub, and he has served as its interim head at its launch in 2019. In 2010, while on leave from Princeton University, he served as senior advisor to the president of Korea, where he is from. He took a leading role in formulating financial stability policy in Korea and developing the agenda for the G20 during Korea's presidency. Digital currencies are drawing increasing attention around the world. Many central banks have been actively studying the costs and benefits of issuing central bank digital currencies, in short, CBDC. Some central banks have already launched their own CBDC or at least started regional trials. The issuance of CBDC and the associated ecosystem established, as well as new policy is implemented, will certainly raise concerns about competition between different stakeholders payment system integrity, data security, and privacy. In today's webinar, Dr. Xin will first talk about his co-author paper, Central Bank Digital Currencies, Motives, Economic Implications, and the Research Frontier. His talk will focus on the motivations of central banks to issue CBDC and the implications for banks, economic digitalization, financial stability, and monetary policy. After Dr. Xin's presentation, there will be at about half an hour Q&A, and I will be the moderator. Throughout Dr. Shin's presentation, please feel free to type questions in the Q&A box, and I will direct your questions to Dr. Shin towards the end. Dr. Shin, please take it away. Thank you, Hey Thank you for the very nice introduction, and it's um, it's great to join you um, and um, and the and the audience today. On a very important topic. Uh, and it's very appropriate that we uh, phrase and frame the questions within the context of uh, the public policy goals. Uh, let me share some slides um, while we sit here. I hope you can see that. Um, as, well as, the, as well as the jointly authored paper, what I thought I would do is also to draw some material from the um, BIS annual economic report uh, that we published last year, and uh, which we are continuing to uh, develop into the course of this year. So um, just the basics, which is um, um, what, are, you know, what are CBDCs? And this is something that most of you will know already. Uh, central bank digital currencies, um, can be thought of as being a digital version of cash in that uh, they are a direct claim on the central bank, but in digital form. So like cash, um, it is a direct claim. So that's the top arrow there. Um, and also, but uh, rather like uh, bank deposits, which um, you can use to, uh, to make payments, um, it's also in digital form. And uh, um, here you see the third arrow. Now, 
exactly how this kind of system would work um, would depend on the design uh, choices. But one principle that we have uh, put out as being a very important one uh, is that uh, CBDCs uh, would work best as part of a two-tier system where the central bank provides uh, the foundations of the monetary system, uh, but the private sector uh, financial intermediaries would conduct most of the customer-facing activities. Uh, so what is the rationale for this? Well, the central bank issues uh, the unit of account, and in that sense, trust um, in the currency ultimately rests on the trust in the central bank. So the, so the central bank's role is crucial in uh, giving the system uh, the credibility and the, um, and the confidence to the users that uh, um, in, the, in the monetary unit. On the other hand, the customer facing activities can certainly be taken on by the private sector as they are today, uh, but with the additional feature that uh, what is being um, transmitted would be a direct claim on the central bank. So let me um, go into some more details later in this, in this presentation. Uh, and hey, why, as you just said, there is a great uh, deal of discussion on uh, whether it's desirable um, to issue a CBDC. And to the extent that you're going to be issuing the CBDC, what um, are the objectives um, that is motivating you? The way that we have uh, laid it out in our annual economic report chapter is that um, the system of CBDCs um, would be one very good way of uh, addressing um, the, the various policy goals that arise from uh, the centrality of data in the digital economy. And we call it the triple imperative. And the triple imperative consists of the corners of this triangle. So on the one hand, we would like a financial system, a monetary system in particular, which fosters competition and financial inclusion. And we can do that by ensuring that intermediaries um, uh, operate in a way that uh, users can, can use in a seamless way. On the other hand, we would like the system to incorporate uh, the basics of uh, integrity. That's to say uh, the, uh, the assurance that uh, the monetary system in particular is going to foster uh, uh, a, a, a payment system uh, that uh, guards against um, uh, money laundering and other illicit activities, and ultimately, which has to be based on uh, real name uh, users. So KYC, know your customer rules, will be also a very important part of the system, just as they are now. But finally, when we get to, uh, when we get to the third corner of the triangle, we have to do all of this in a way that ensures privacy um, and a good framework for data governance. So how would we actually do that? Let me go to the first corner of the triangle, which is uh, the imperative to have a, an open and competitive uh, monetary system that will also foster financial inclusion. And the idea here is that we would like a system uh, that is conducive to um, entry, that is um, a system where the private sector providers can compete on a level playing field, and where uh, the system is interoperable in the sense that uh, having uh, access via one uh, service provider gives uh, you a way to interact with all the other service providers in the system. So one very simple way of summarizing it would be to say we would like a public square model of the monetary system rather than a walled garden where uh, you're shielding the particular ecosystem from outside competition. So this photo is uh, the photo of the uh, market square here in Basel. And uh, you see the stall holders in the market who are competing, but who are also um, providing a range of different services which will attract uh, the, the users to the market. And all of them will be following the rules as set by um, the town authorities. And that is the, 
uh, the metaphor for the system that uh, we have in mind. So what are some of the uh, benefits of that kind of system? Uh, well, an open marketplace can channel network effects, which are really the, uh, the defining feature of the monetary system in that the more users flock to a particular system, the more useful it is for others to join that system. And um, once you get a critical mass, you can have a self-reinforcing uh, dynamic where you have more and more users joining the platform and thereby making the system uh, much more vibrant. Now, just as um, in this marketplace setting, in here, the stall holders consist of cheese sellers here on the left, fruit and vegetable sellers on the middle and right. They're offering different goods, but together uh, they are forming a, uh, a vibrant marketplace which attracts users to the market. And to the extent that uh, they are uh, going to attract more users, uh, what we will see is that even though the different sellers may be in competition with each other, uh, in the aggregate, once you take into account the network effects, they may actually uh, contribute towards the, the vibrancy of the marketplace as a whole. And this is the kind of dynamic that we laid out um, in a previous annual economic report chapter um, a couple of years ago, where uh, even in, uh, beyond CBDCs, um, in any kind of system where the central bank plays a key role, uh, there is an important role here for the economics, the industrial organization of the monetary system. In this kind of setting, of course, the data, the data governance will be crucial. And um, let me mention two aspects which will um, be very important as we discuss CBDCs later on. So before we get to CBDCs, let's think about the problem much more from the economics and the industrial organization aspects which features of the marketplace in the payment marketplace would ensure that we have a level competitive playing field and the uh, ability to use real names uh, while preserving uh, data privacy. But one aspect is to give control over personal data to the individual. And so we need a framework uh, and often it's uh, underpinned by the legal framework that gives uh, right to the individual to data portability and the use of personal data for any particular commercial purposes would need the consent of the individual concerned. And uh, uh, many, many jurisdictions now have such a legal, uh, such a legal framework in place. For example, um, in the European Union, uh, there is a GDPR framework which gives um, this uh, data governance framework that gives data portability, um, uh, you know, rights to the individual, and any use of personal data will need consent. But having said that, of course, data portability by itself is not going to be sufficient to have a competitive marketplace because uh, data portability will not be very effective if the data itself is not uh, uh, in a form that can be used by competitors. So if you request your personal data from a big tech provider and what comes along is a very large PDF file, that is more like a data dump rather than a useful um, control over your data in a form that's usable. So as well as the, uh, the legal right to your own personal data, there has to be technical standards that allow effective use um, of your data in a system uh, which uh, promotes interoperability between different service providers. And a key technical innovation here um, is the so-called application uh, programming interface or the set of application programming interfaces, which are technical um, uh, so which are um, technical standards and the, and the platforms which allow secure data exchange in a common format. So one uh, typical example would be the so-called account information service where individuals can uh, actually open the app of one bank 
uh, and check the balances in all the other accounts at the other banks within the same system. And this um, can only be possible, as you can imagine, if there's secure data exchange in a way that uh, preserves privacy um, and the uh, recipients of the data have access only to the data that is absolutely necessary for that transaction. And uh, the, the technical standards here rely on public key cryptography in exactly the same way uh, that cryptocurrencies uh, you know, use public key cryptography uh, for um, uh, updating the blockchain in a decentralized way. Another example of an API is the so-called payment initiation service, where you can open the app of one bank and make um, an outgoing payment from the account of another bank within the same system. And again, the recipient of that instruction will need to know that it is genuinely uh, you who has made that uh, um, outgoing payment request. And so there has to be secure data exchange, uh, which will generate the authentication that allow you to perform those operations. Now, nothing in this page of the slide has, um, uh, you know, leads inevitably to a CBDC. However, uh, a CBDC will need to have elements of these, uh, this kind of data architecture in place because, um, you know, we will need a system where we will use um, a digital ID as well as the secure data exchange within the system, which will allow the central bank um, to update the ledger of the transactions. So to use the marketplace analogy, uh, we're thinking of the central bank settlement accounts as a public square. The central bank lays down uh, the rules of the game and the users will be interacting um, on a competitive, uh, on, um, in a system which has uh, rigorous data governance rules, as well as the uh, uh, your rights to your personal data, and where the service providers can compete on a level, competitive level playing field. Now, before we get to CBDCs, I'd like to just spend one moment on a non-CBDC system uh, that uses exactly this kind of uh, data architecture. And I think this point is very important because um, you know, when we think about CBDCs, we often focus um, excessively on the technology. We don't often uh, give enough thought to the data architecture that is often more important for the public, uh, for the public policy goals. Um, so for this reason, it's very useful to look at an example of a non-CBDC uh, retail fast payment system that has many of the elements of the data architecture uh, that are in common with the CBDC. So in Brazil, they launched a retail fast payment system called PIX uh, in November 2020. And um, it's been one of those uh, rollouts which uh, is really very rare in the, in the rapid success, in the rapid adoption of users. So in the um, 15, 16 months since the launch of PIX, it has signed up uh, over two thirds of the adult population in Brazil. So it has uh, signed up 114 million individuals and over 9 million companies. Um, and the remarkable fact is that uh, around 50 million uh, people who have signed on to PIX did not actually make a bank transfer before uh, they were a member of the PIX platform. So this kind of adoption is something that uh, is uh, a, um, an example that you would expect in a system with very strong network effects, where the more people use the system, the more people would find it attractive to join the system. And uh, one aspect of this rapid adoption has been uh, the, the way that uh, the number of transactions has grown within, uh, uh, within the PIX platform. So uh, on this graph, what I'm showing you is uh, the relative numbers of transactions um, between PIX here in green 
and the other means of payments. So in debit uh, and credit cards here in black and purple. And you can see that uh, in just over a year, uh, the PIX payments are now poised to overtake the uh, number of payments made in credit and, uh, in, in credit and debit cards. Now, one of the uh, reasons for this rapid adoption uh, was the way that uh, the system was rolled out. Um, so just as I showed you in one of the previous slides, the idea here is that the central bank provides both uh, the, uh, the infrastructure here, which is the, the platform itself, as well as the rule book. Uh, and it sets the rules on access and costs. So in the case of PICS, for individuals, it's free. And for merchants, uh, there is a nominal fee to cover the cost, but it's a, a, a much lower cost than for credit and debit cards. So if you see it uh, on this slide, if you look at the bar charts on the right, um, the PIX uh, person to business payments, P2B, uh, there is a charge of 22 basis points which is, of course, much lower than uh, the standard merchant charges you would see in credit and debit cards. The other element here was that uh, the large banks were mandated to join the system. And that was a very important uh, spur in kickstarting the network effects. The additional element was that, uh, by coincidence, PIX was rolled out during the pandemic. And the pandemic um, uh, payments to individuals also was done through PIX and which further turbocharged the network effects in the initial period. So I think we can see from this, um, this kind of example, the power of a open competitive system uh, with a central bank at the center, but where the central bank works with the private sector in the, uh, in the rollout of a CBDC. So, so far what I've, told you is a standard payment system, a non-CBDC <clears throat> a non-CBDC payment system. How would one translate this into a CBDC? Well, if you think about what I said earlier about the data architecture, the data architecture uh, is about a digital ID system and the data architect spaces that allow secure data exchange. Um, already you have most of the elements that will take you to a, uh, to a retail CBDC. And to some extent, if you have uh, these elements in place of a digital ID and uh, um, secure API, you are, let's say 70 or 80% of the way towards having a retail CBDC. The additional element that you need to have a retail CBDC is to have um, the one feature, which is that what is being transacted is a direct claim of the central bank rather than a claim on an intermediary. So let me um, um, go, to that, uh, uh, go to that element. Um, so let's go to these, uh, these two important elements. So, so the first one is the, the notion of a digital ID. Of course, um, in the current system, in many economies, it's the commercial banks who are the guardians of um, personal data. So they're the ones who onboard customers, who keep records uh, of your name and address and your payment records. And if they have a, uh, if they also operate uh, debit and credit cards, they would have that data as well. And the whole uh, system is protected by a rigorous legal framework uh, that gives um, uh, rights to the individual on data privacy. Now, when we get to a CBDC system, we need something which is one level above that in that for the system to work in a seamless way, we have to have a system where the digital ID can be verified and authenticated by other intermediaries, even though you're a customer of one intermediary. And so um, in that uh, kind of system, we can think of a whole continuum of different ways of having a digital ID system, all the way from a purely private um, service provider issued uh, digital ID, all the way to a government issued digital ID. Now in between, we can have uh, a digital ID system that is issued by a consortium of private sector uh, banks or other uh, service providers. 
So in the case of Sweden, for example, there is a system where uh, the banks collectively operate a, a digital ID system, all the way to a system, uh, let's say, in, in India, um, operated, uh, so, the, so the digital ID system in India called Aadhaar, uh, which is a biometric digital ID system that's issued by the government. It's, um, uh, it, has, uh, the, it, it is used for government services and it's linked to administrative uh, databases. So there's a whole range of different uh, uh, range of possibilities. The important point, of course, is that to ensure data privacy, we need uh, a rigorous uh, framework where no one individual service provider can have the full picture. They only would have the information that is absolutely necessary to execute you know, your transactions. Uh, and it's only the individual that actually has access to the full picture. So it's the jigsaw puzzle principle, so-called. And that jigsaw puzzle principle would also apply uh, when we include the public authorities here as well. So it's not only the, uh, the commercial banks, uh, the big tech companies or the telecom company, but it's also the tax authorities or the AML authorities and including also the central bank. So the central bank doesn't need to know uh, everything about you to actually execute the transactions on the CBDC ledger or to execute the uh, payment on the fast payment system. It just needs to know that you have enough balances uh, so that you can make uh, a record in the ledger that says so-and-so has made a payment to this other person uh, at such and such a time. And um, this is where the technology will, will be very important. And here, um, uh, we have a, a, now a very good idea of how these uh, technologies actually work because they're already in use um, in the APIs that are uh, underlying the retail fast payment system. And it's uh, indeed the technology that comes from uh, public key cryptography that was developed in the 1970s and uh, which is now uh, behind uh, you know, secure browsers for your, for your internet browser uh, and other uh, secure transactions on the internet. So there's nothing very experimental about that technology. Now, what about the other aspect, which is all about uh, the secure, uh, the direct claim? And here we can envisage different ways of uh, implementing, uh, you know, that uh, that notion. So one idea would be to give everyone an account directly in the central bank. So whether it's a user or a merchant, you would have a direct claim on the central bank just as you have a direct claim on the commercial bank these days. And this is what we call the direct model. Now, in this case, um, the central bank will also need to have the full uh, information on the users and merchants, but it would imply a much um, more, um, a much more um, comprehensive role of the central bank in the financial system. So it's like saying, the central bank is really a super commercial bank as well as being the central bank. And um, if you make a payment to your landlord and the payment doesn't go through, you would actually call up the central bank and ask, you know, where is my payment to the landlord? So the central bank would actually have to have a very large customer facing uh, activity as well as its policy goals as well. And that um, I think poses a, a great deal of um, difficult policy questions in that it implies a much more um, uh, commercially oriented central bank. It also means that commercial banks would be left outside the financial system. And then we would have one large central bank. And for this reason, uh, there are many uh, unattractive elements um, in this direct model. Another approach would be the so-called intermediated model, which is um, a way to think about the way that the current intermediation system works where the PSP, the payment service provider, would actually keep a record of the ledger and uh, would be operating wallets for the users rather than um, uh, issuing deposits. And it's the private sector PSP that would keep the ledger. So if you look at on this uh, diagram, you see that the ledger behind the PSP in the middle is very detailed. There are many lines there, which means that it has the detailed records. But uh, when it transmits the, um, the information to the central bank for net um, reconciliation purposes, for the netting purposes, 
it would only send the net amounts to the central bank. So that's really very much like the current system, uh, whereby um, the central bank would not know the detailed transactions of the individual, but only the transactions between financial intermediaries. Now, the, um, the attraction of this kind of system is that it's very similar to the current system. And it'll, it would also uh, lessen the uh, worry that the central bank has too much data because the central bank would only keep um, the, uh, the net amounts between intermediaries rather than the full digital ledger. On the other hand, um, it also means that there is uh, an onus on the private sector PSPs to keep a faithful record of the ledger itself. And because these are actually uh, data um, which only reside with the PSP, uh, there would be the operational risk of what happens if there is a data hack, uh, what happens if that data is corrupted, the central bank would not have the ability to recreate the ledger uh, based on its own information. So one um, intermediate step is uh, the so-called hybrid model, where we take the intermediated model, but also add the feature that the central bank keeps a master copy of the uh, detailed retail transactions. Uh, and so, you know, this is a model where there is a, um, there is a large ledger within the central bank uh, that has the full record of all the transactions, uh, not necessarily in the real names, but by the alias, which will um, actually map directly to a real name kept by the PSP. Uh, but there is an overview uh, function of the central bank itself. So if we look at the, um, the degree to which the central bank is involved, in the direct model here on the left, where everyone has an account at the central bank, that implies a very large and quite an onerous role of the central bank. On the intermediated model on the right, this is quite close to the current system, uh, but it has this additional um, feature that the central bank uh, would need to supplement its current regulation with much more rigorous regulation on ensuring the data um, integrity of the, of, the, of the intermediary. And the hybrid model here in the middle, which is um, a model where you have the intermediaries playing a very important role, but where the central bank also keeps a master copy of the ledger so that you can recreate um, the, the data in case uh, there is data corruption or there's a hack uh, or uh, some other glitch in the system. And the um, ECNY in China, as you know, is an example of this, uh, of this uh, middle hybrid system where uh, the, the People's Bank of China has this, uh, uh, this overall ledger, uh, but then the customer facing activities are actually uh, conducted by uh, the intermediaries who operate wallets. And among those uh, wallet uh, uh, operators would also be uh, the large payment uh, um, uh, the, the payment operators uh, that are also currently operating, um, like WeChat Pay and Alipay. Now, what about uh, some of the applications? So let me just conclude with a couple of slides on uh, you know, one potential application. And this is a very important uh, um, uh, discussion uh, because one very good question that uh, arises in this subject um, is if you already have a well-functioning retail fast payment system like uh, Brazil's PIX, what is the additional gain that you would achieve if you go the full way towards a retail CBDC or indeed a CBDC system where you have the, uh, the banks involved in a wholesale CBDC platform? So one aspect here, which is very important, is the, um, is the international uh, dimension, where if you have a CBDC system, you can think of a platform uh, where the international payments themselves can be thought of as being um, transacted on a common platform that allows um, the, um, the secure exchange of central bank uh, claims in different currencies on the same platform. And one of the motivations for thinking about that kind of platform is that it would actually uh, simplify the, the architecture of the international monetary system and thereby uh, reduce the cost 
and um, actually reduce some of the burdens that are associated with um, the long chains of intermediaries that are needed for uh, the correspondent banking system. So uh, typically when you make a um, a bank transfer to someone in another currency in another jurisdiction, you'd have to go to your bank. So I'm looking at the top line here. And then the original, um, so the originating bank would uh, issue an order to another bank in the same jurisdiction that has access to uh, the, the foreign exchange market. You would make the foreign exchange calculation, which would, and, and then send an instruction to the correspondent bank in the other jurisdiction who then transmits the, um, the funds to the, to the receiving bank and ultimately to the payee. This kind of system um, has a long history uh, uh, and there's a good reason for why the system has evolved in this way. Uh, but uh, we know that this kind of uh, system uh, you know, can uh, be very time consuming and is associated with, uh, with costs at, uh, at each step. And the question is, can we think of a way of simplifying this kind of system and thereby achieve a, a much more streamlined monetary architecture in the international monetary system, just as uh, we have in the textbooks? And um, let me just conclude with uh, a very brief discussion of some um, experiments that the BIS Innovation Hub is conducting uh, in the so-called multi-CBDC uh, platforms, and they are an example of a uh, model of interlinking payment systems, which uses a common platform. Uh, so rather than simply thinking about uh, having uh, a link that joins different uh, payment systems, it is a much more far reaching solution, where you have a common platform, um, where the jurisdictions can come um, and operate under a, uh, a common infrastructure. And we're conducting three experiments at the moment um, in, our, um, in our three BIS Innovation Hub centers. One is uh, a project called Jura, which is happening here in Switzerland. And the partners here are uh, the, the Swiss National Bank and the Central Bank of France, Banque de France. And then the three of us, uh, we have recently conducted an experiment uh, using a, a platform called Corda, um, and let me just say, say a couple of words on this. Um, we need decentralization because we have more than one central bank involved and therefore more than one currency. But because we're using real names, we cannot use blockchains um, as in cryptocurrencies because we don't want to post all the transactions uh, in a public way so that everyone can see you know, uh, um, you know, what transactions someone has made with, uh, with whomever. So we need to preserve privacy. So we, um, so these kind of these kind of platforms use public key cryptography, you know, where it preserves transparency, um, you know, way that preserves privacy, but which ensures um, that uh, uh, we can keep track of balances and in a way that um, uh, preserves security as well. And Corda uses uh, the so-called notary system, where the central bank uh, plays a role of, of a notary that keeps. Um, an overview of the integrity of the, uh, of the system. And then since we have two currencies, we would have two notaries. So one for the Swiss franc leg, which is the Swiss National Bank, and one for the euro leg, uh, which is the Banque de France. And the other um, example, so one um, that's actually um, in, in pilot in, in Hong Kong is so, the so-called uh, Enbridge uh, um, uh, system which involves the Bank of Thailand, PBOC, and the UAE. And here, because we have more than two central banks involved, uh, we need a model that uh, uh, accommodates many central banks coming together. We need a platform uh, where uh, we can have the currency exchange done at the same time as the, uh, as the payments themselves. Um, the, one of the earlier versions uh, used a version of, um, of Hyperledger Bazu, uh, Hyperledger Bezu, which is, um, uh, you know, which is an Ethereum client. But then we have um, you know, used other kinds of platforms along the way as well. Another very similar example is uh, Project Dunbar, which is uh, something that we're doing in our Singapore center in the BIS Innovation Hub. 
Now, within the broad um, outlines, there are differences uh, in the way that you implement these kinds of pol- uh, these kind of platforms. One particular uh, question is: Do you give direct access to the uh, a non-resident to a CBDC in um, in the um, in one jurisdiction, or do you need to have um, a an AML layer uh, which ensures additional AML checks along the way? And that's the difference between Dunbar and an Embridge here, for example. Let me uh, conclude there, uh, Hiwai, and then we can perhaps go to some uh, some Q and A. Thank you, Dr. Shin, uh, for the fascinating presentation. Um, I actually have seen your talk at the World Bank, uh, and every time I learn something more. Um, there are already some questions in the Q&A box, but I cannot hold myself down uh, and not to ask uh, two questions that have been in my mind for a while. Uh, I really like your picture about the public uh, square and the gated square. Um, I guess there's always an issue about how traditional banks need to reposition themselves, knowing that a lot of these technologies in the end are the intermediating, right? You know, for example, in your uh, most direct uh, way, uh, you know, when a central bank can actually handle most of the jobs using these new technologies. And, you know, in that world, we actually don't need banks. So first, do you see any country central bank moving into that direction? And second, if so, how should banks think about you know, their positions in the future uh, and how should regulators think about how to uh, you know, govern this uh, new banking uh, structure or ecosystem? That's a very good, that's a very good question, Hei Wai. And, and, and uh, as you say, the direct model uh, would imply a very far reaching um, change from our current financial system. And um, I think it's fair to say that uh, uh, no central bank at the moment um, and none that I'm aware of, is actually thinking about going to a direct model. And indeed, um, those central banks that have um, laid out their intentions have been very careful to exclude uh, that model. So uh, in the Federal Reserve report from the US that was published um, at the end of last year, they make it very clear uh, that uh, the, Fe- the Federal Reserve is only thinking about, to, well, if they go to a CBDC, they would only consider an, uh, this two-tier solution, and um, I think that's a very, uh, I, I think that's a very, you know, uh, uh, you know, good um, approach for the reasons that I actually laid out. Um, and um, let me just say something which uh, probably is underestimated, which is, um, you know, when you uh, listen to commercial banks, um, you know, in this kind of discussion. There is a great deal of worry that uh, you know, if there is a CBDC that's uh, deployed, uh, would this imply a migration of deposits away from commercial banks to a CBDC? So that's one type of worry. The other type of worry is, well, if um, there is a uh, erosion of the profit potential you know, from payments technologies, and in particular, if credit and debit card fees are now pushed down because of the competition, uh, from an open and competitive system, an inclusive system like PIX, would that not also be uh, a, um, a negative uh, force for the banking sector as a whole? I think on, on, on these um, uh, scores, I think it's very, so let me um, uh, perhaps suggest that, uh, uh, you know, there, there, was a, uh, there was a conversation that's now on on um, the BIS website, uh, where I actually had a so-called fireside chat uh, with uh, uh, Roberto Campos Neto, the governor of the Central Bank of Brazil, where uh, we had a discussion about the PIC system. Uh, And one thing that he said, uh, which really resonated with me and with the audience was the idea that um, uh, once banks realize the the additional business potential uh, in a system like this, um, they're actually much more willing to embrace the new technology and actually work with the central bank. Now, one example that, um, uh, so l- let me give you a couple of examples of uh, what this uh, might be. If we have a system where there is um, 
uh, privacy and uh, data governance. Um, and uh, the, uh, the ability of individuals to have control over the data. Uh, new people will come into the system uh, and when they apply for a loan, for example, they can actually uh, point the bank to their data trail, uh, which then they can make available by giving consent uh, to the bank uh, to actually access. So within that data governance framework, you give bank the uh, you give the banks the loan from um, the ability to go and uh, uh, and check your data trail, and even the um, the borrowers who were previously excluded from the system would then be able to access financial services in a much more inclusive way, and that expands the um, the business opportunities for the banks themselves. So even though they would need to reduce some of the rents <clears throat> that come from the credit card fees, they would have uh, a much larger marketplace with which, uh, you know, within which to operate. Uh, and you know, that actually provides additional business opportunities. Operating wallets um, and the additional access to data would also give additional ways to bundle services. So uh, rather than thinking about competition in a um, traditional IO sense, of just competing on the price, you're actually also differentiating your product by bundling your services with additional, <clears throat> with additional uh, digital services uh, as part of your offering. So if you're a big tech provider uh, and you can bundle your payment services with, with additional services that come from uh, you know, ride hailing or uh, from all the you know, uh, e-commerce, social media, those kind of bundling services will also uh, be able to um, um, provide, uh, uh, provide value added and therefore expand market opportunities as well. And so for all these different reasons, I think it's very important for us as economists uh, to think about the IO of the system within the broader setting of how do we actually increase the size of the pie as well as uh, the proportion of the pie uh, that, uh, that, uh, that we can appropriate um, in, the, in the market setting. Great, thank you, Dr. Xi. Let me answer the second question very quickly uh, and then turn to the Q&A questions. Um, there is a very geopolitical aspect uh, about uh, digital, uh, central bank digital currencies. Uh, as we all know, uh, Russia has been under heavy financial sanctions uh, by the West. Do you think you know, this kind of digital uh, central bank uh, currencies essentially would substitute the traditional uh, sort of like payment transaction system like SWIFT, for example, allowing some of the sanction parties to potentially escape, uh, you know, the kind of uh, sanctions that we see around the world. But broadly speaking, uh, I think, do you see sort of fragmentation in the international financial system due to multiple standards and multiple technologies being adopted by different uh, major central banks around the world? Yes. And of course, that's a very important question. And the short answer is no. Um, I think the, um, so in other words, um, a CBDC system in the way that I've just outlined uh, would be very much keeping to the spirit of the current system in that uh, it is the central bank who is providing the foundation of the monetary system and the private sector players are actually uh, you know, operating on the platform provided by the central bank. And because we are using real names, and because there is a ledger uh, that is uh, you know, uh, uh, also in common with the retail fast payment system that uses real names, um, it's uh, very unlike um, cash, physical cash circulating in briefcases in black markets. Um, so in the case of physical cash in, brief, in briefcases, uh, you know, that kind of cash can circulate anonymously uh, without the control of the issuing central bank. Whereas if you think about the way that a CBDC would work, in order for a non-resident to have access to a CBDC, you would need to have um, um, a, um, you know, that user would need to figure that the, in the uh, ledger that is maintained by the central bank itself. And if you're not a member of that, uh, of that system and the issuing central bank has not given you access to that system, you have no ability to make transactions you know, using that CBDC. So that's the, the first point. Uh, CBDCs are not the same 
as uh, cash that's circulating anonymously in the black market. The, the second point to make is that CBDCs, uh, because they're using real names, are unlike uh, cryptocurrencies, uh, which are uh, digital tokens that are, um, uh, that are used purely on the basis of private keys. And with a private key, of course, you can just transact without using your real name and therefore, the border really is not uh, uh, really a matter, uh, um, is, is not really an impediment for your use. Um, but of course, uh, to the extent that uh, cryptocurrencies would need to be transferred to real money in order for, um, for the use case, unless the vendor actually accepts uh, cryptocurrencies in payment for real goods and services, you would need to transfer the money back to real money and at that point, we would need an off-ramp, so-called, uh, which would be a commercial bank, which would need to be uh, uh, an other, some other uh, payment service provider that has access to the conventional payment system. And there, um, uh, again, the authorities would have um, a large uh, degree of control over the misuse of these kind of digital tokens. So the first point to make is that CBDCs uh, will not entail a fundamental change in the way that uh, the monetary system would operate in the, um, in the international setting. But of course, uh, as you've said, um, uh, um, there is a larger limitation, as you put it, in the monetary system. But if you think about that question, that is not really a matter of the technology or about the CBDCs as such, but it's a matter of uh, the way that the monetary system, even the conventional monetary system, uh, is then put together for international uh, use. And let me conclude with one final point, which is a very, very important point, which is that uh, we should not think of um, uh, the technology itself implying a very far-reaching change in the architecture of the monetary system, because after all, the payment system does not float um, independently of the underlying economic transactions. The payments are there to, uh, to be the mirror image of the real-world transactions. And just because you have a digital means of payment, it doesn't mean that the fundamental underlying economics uh, are also going to change. So as long as we have uh, invoicing and therefore the financial flows uh, and therefore the economic transactions are very much following the current um, financial relationships in the economy, uh, I don't think we can really expect a far reaching change just because uh, we have a digital means of payment. Great, thank you. Uh, let me ask the first uh, question from the audience, which is related to uh, our discussion just now. Do you envisage the co coexistence of CBDC and cryptocurrencies? I think that's uh, entirely possible. Um, and uh, in fact, uh, I would just point you to um, some of the things that we've done in this area. Uh, in fact, there was an event um, in Zurich earlier in the week, uh, where we discussed how decentralized finance or DeFi, um, uh, uh, you know, could interact with uh, central bank digital currencies. And DeFi, as you know, um, is an example of the cryptocurrency universe, uh, where you're using um, these, uh, uh, it's part of the crypto universe. Um, I think one of the, so one thing to say is that uh, cryptocurrencies uh, and CBDCs although they have uh, the same element uh, in, in common, which is that, that they're both digital, that's really about it. Um, uh, they're very, very different uh, objects. So one is, a, um, uh, is conventional money in the sense that it's a, it's a um, unit of account issued by the central bank, and therefore very much part of the conventional monetary system. Cryptocurrencies, um, uh, you know, they are... Uh, uh, you know, run through um, the, the cryptocurrency networks that use private keys. Um, and they uh, run on very, very different principles. Now, of course, they can coexist. Uh, uh, at some points, uh, uh, I think, uh, you know, there is scope for CBDCs, in particular, um, for CBDCs to perform many of the same functions, uh, for example, in DeFi. So in, in the case of the multi-CBDC platforms, we can think of uh, CBDCs performing many of the uh, smart contracts that are performed in, in cryptocurrencies. And indeed, um, the basic functions uh, where we have payment versus payment, 
payment versus delivery for a security settlement, that's already in place and that's already been trialed. And so um, to some extent, I think once CBDCs become more common, we can imagine many of the functionalities of cryptocurrencies being incorporated into CBDCs. And because of the many advantages uh, of CBDCs that I've outlined, we can imagine CBDCs being much more prevalent even within the DeFi universe. Um, and um, you know, because of the many other short, uh, the shortcomings of the cryptocurrency DeFi, we can imagine CBDCs um, playing a much bigger role relative to those. Great. Another question about technologies. What are the pros and cons of using distributed ledger technology, such as blockchain, to underpin CBDC? If not blockchain, what other technologies can be used? And what are the pros and cons? Yeah, so um, in the case of a uh, multi-currency system, and as I said at the end of my presentation, uh, because, um, so, you know, when we have more than one currency involved, we have more than one central bank, and therefore there's going to be more than one CBDC within the same platform. And in that kind of setting, decentralization is essential. Uh, it's a necessity rather than a choice. And uh, in the multi-CBDC platforms that I mentioned at the end, uh, decentralization is very much part of the, of the design. But as I said, because we're using real names, uh, we cannot use a standard blockchain technology uh, because blockchain technology just has all the transactions listed publicly and then hitched uh, onto the latest um, uh, block. However, there, there is technology um, that ensures privacy uh, but at the same time ensures decentralization. And we can use the same type of uh, public key cryptography. So it has to be DLT, but which is not blockchain. Um, and there, there are many solutions. There are many so-called enterprise uh, um, uh, DLT platforms that allows that kind of secure data exchange while at the same time uh, you know, uh, ensuring privacy. And the same kinds of zero knowledge proofs, other cryptographic techniques can be used to do that. It, within the domestic context, in the retail context, you would not need a DLT uh, or indeed a blockchain technology. But of course, you can also uh, employ that purely within a domestic context. But there, the choice is really about uh, what kinds of system you would like domestically rather than a necessity. So within the domestic context, it's a choice. Within the international context, it would need to be a necessity. Thank you. Um, there is a question about uh, two more questions, if uh, you're okay, Dr. Shin. There's a question about uh, the payment solution companies, uh, including the traditional credit card companies like Visa and Master. How are they going to survive when CBDC are so effective and uh, so cheap compared to their services? Well, I think, uh, I, I, and, and that's um, going back to my, my previous uh, point about the expansion of the size of the market rather than purely about uh, um, an increased share. Um, I think the, you know, when we look back to history and think about uh, the big innovations that have uh, created value, uh, the incumbents have always adapted. Uh, they have, you know, moved to different business models. Um, I think there are ways of, um, of increasing the size of the pie uh, where the incumbents clearly will have a different role. Um, but I think we have no, you know, we have learned enough about these kind of systems uh, where, um, and there are very good, hist good his historical examples where uh, the, the evolution of the business model uh, is, is something that is going to be a key um, uh, in a management task of the private sector. And that's something where the, uh, the official, um, where, the, um, where the official authorities, including the central bank, can work very closely, uh, hand in glove with the, um, uh, with the, private sector in uh, finding a viable and indeed finding a vibrant market model, uh, which will allow the, um, the provision of better services. And the private sector, as, um, as we have seen throughout history, is much better at meeting, at uh, you know, displaying creativity and ingenuity in serving customers better. Uh, and, I'm, and I'm an optimist uh, that uh, you know, there will be a very important role as we go to the next step in the business model. Okay, I think you answered most of the questions already. There's still one uh, which is related to the geopolitical situation, if you don't mind. 
jurisdictions like India and the EU are rushing ahead with CBDCs. What have they done? Should they be doing to reach out to international partners before they do so by themselves? Uh, I think the short answer is no. Um, and we've seen that uh, in, um, so if the objective is to uh, have a system which will serve your domestic constituency better, uh, it will be very similar to the way that Brazil rolled out its retail fast payment system, PIX. Um, you're just going to the next uh, step uh, in that journey. So uh, if, it's a, if the objective is domestic, of course, you know, um, and uh, the goals very much are domestically oriented, I don't think you, you, know, you, you, you need to have a preparatory stage for that. Of course, you, know, you would need to um, be part of the conversation, uh, be you know, all, you know, all, um, uh, providing lessons for others, but also learning from others as well. When we get to the international uh, interoperability, then of course, uh, it's essential that we get together. And I would just say the BIS has traditionally played that role of uh, fostering the cooperation of central banks. And after all, this is about money and therefore about central banks. And so let me sort of perhaps conclude by saying uh, the BIS is here. Uh, it's always played this role and uh, we envisage playing this role in a much more uh, in a central way going forward. This is a perfect conclusion of today's uh, sharing. Thank you so much, Takashin, for one hour uh, sharing with us. Uh, I know you have other important meetings to go. Um, so uh, hopefully uh, we can welcome you to Hong Kong uh, when travel becomes easier again. Thank you so much. Um, so I want to see if the AGI team has anything to announce. Um, all right. Oh, basically this. Uh, just uh, sure, so follow us uh, on different Excellent. social media platforms. Uh, and Dr. Shin, thank you again. Uh, have a good day. And I'm sure you have a lot of important policies and recommendations to make uh, on these issues that we just discussed.